Hello everyone and welcome to another PWN Design Studio Discovering Geoflow video. Last time we talked about the Highland macro as well as the Killspike, Sandstone, and Neoflow uh, nodes. We may be coming back to some of those like Neoflow perhaps um, in you know later videos um, but in this one we're, I'm going to try to talk about different nodes. So Island last time, this time let's do um, let's do alien just because it's the first one. A little bit easier to you know go in a row the way you don't get confused. So uh, <clears throat> the alien properties are relatively easy. Uh, the scale just you know changes the scale of the, the terrain and uh, the bump changes how much bump the terrain has so the detail pretty much. So the detail is really high, detail is really low. Uh, just depending on what you change in the bump. Flat takes the base of the terrain and moves it up and creates a nice flat terrain, as you can see. Um, I'm not going to have any of that. And then seed again just randomly generates a different terrain. So, a lot of a lot of settings in these uh, uh, geoglyph nodes are relatively the same. They have you know the scale, the the amount of noise or distortion you want. The randomness factor so they all have this you know basic layout with their settings however they all create different effects so uh, with that said <clears throat> the alien macro is really cool because it gives you a non-standard landscape and what I mean by non non-standard is you don't really find these kind of uh, formations inside of uh, world machines regular nodes as well as in real life so I'm going to save it because World Machine likes to crash when I'm recording video. So I'll build it. <clears throat> and you can see it builds really fast. It just took about three seconds. And these are the formations we have. Very alien-like. Not something that you would see in real life too often on Earth, if not at all. And uh, yeah, it looks really good. This is really cool. You can use this for like maybe a video game <clears throat> or maybe if you're doing like a sci-fi video really nice. It even has these little uh, small grooves in them that look like you know asteroid craters. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and it has this big crater right here almost. So uh, if you hover over any of these nodes they give you a description uh, and most of them tell you uh, what it's recommended to use with. So it tells you for this alien node that it's recommended to use it with crater as well as pockmark. Um, and it, sometimes it's really hard to find what you want. Pockmark's right here, but if you didn't know where it's at, you can just go down here and search for it there. Um, or you can turn on speech recognition, and all you have to do is say, Toolbox, Pockmark. If it finds it, it'll bring it out here. I said it wrong because it's not Pockmark, it's Pockmarks. So, Toolbox, Pockmarks. There it is. So I can combine this with the pockmarks, uh, and and now it's it's working. But I will not use the speech recognition because I like to manually do things a lot of the time. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's call that good. Uh, I'm just gonna focus on the alien macro for right now. I'm not gonna use the creator or the pockmark, uh, but I will use another modifier. So let's look for one. Let's uh. Uh, let's do one that makes more sense with an alien planet, other than Pockmark and Crater, because I am a rebel. Don't want to do what I am told. Let's look at this ghost one. I've seen this in other um, videos uh, on Quad Spinner's website, and you get some really, really cool looking effects. So, <clears throat> uh, what this does is it warps the landscape and makes it look really interesting. So here's the intensity and you can see how that's warping the landscape. With too much warping obviously it can create weird artifacts but you can see how it kinda it, it, it almost angles it a little bit. So I'll keep it about there and anchor just changes you know whether or not you want the terrain to be affected um, and, you know it's not gonna change it based off of any given point whereas an anchor will anchor it probably it looks like in the middle and you can see the drastic change that it gives. So I'll just keep it on and I'll just you know put it right here towards the middle. 
And then altitude, just you can change it whether you want it to affect lower or upper parts of your terrain. Right now it's affecting the entire terrain. But if I change this to be more up, you can see how you know I have it too high, so it's not affecting anything. But if I drag this down, you can see how it's only affecting that altitude range. So that's pretty self-explanatory, just like most nodes inside of World Machine, like the height selector, that's all that is. And then there's the transition, which you know, looks like it's transitioning from bottom to top and affects the train differently that way. So again, there's not a lot of documentation with these nodes. So I'm, the, the amount of information I can give you on what everything does exactly is very limited. Uh, so you just have to kind of play with them to understand what they do. So I'll go ahead and build that and uh, let's look at it. Definitely not the same landscape that we had before. It's a lot more warped. And there's even a little bit of terracing going on right here. So there's a lot of spikes. Lots of little small details that might create a headache after export. So I'm going to go ahead and throw on kill spike. Kill spike and let's connect it. Bam. There we go. And uh, let's turn the detection all the way up, but turn the aggression down. Let's go to about, well, let's look at the preview while we're doing this. So let's go to about four and let's click OK and build that. OK, looks good. So Kill Spike does get rid of a little bit of detail. Um, the hope of using Kill Spike is that after erosion, usually after erosion, um, you can kill off those erosion peaks or those erosion spikes that you get that are really annoying in World Machine. So it did take off a lot of detail, but we can add some of that detail back by throwing in an erosion node. So let's look at a different type of erosion node uh, other than uh, the NeoFlow one. So let's look at the uh, Fluvial one. So let's go ahead and add that. There we go, and it looks like it has a mask input, so you can throw something in there to kind of mask the different amounts of uh, fluvial locations. So you can throw in like a uh, pearl and fractal right here and attach it to the mask, and then this will only affect the parts of that mask. So that's pretty cool. Then they give you the fluvial data, which I'm assuming is probably some um, mapping for like flow lines and whatnot. So let's go ahead and look at this. And you can play with the depth. Doesn't look like it's changing much. It is. I guarantee it. It's changing a little bit. Uh, and then there's the seed, which is just again random. And then there's flow, and you can see how that affects. It affects it quite a bit. Um, so these might be really harsh um, flow maps that we're creating right here, or flow lines. And it also looks like it has kill spike built into it. So you don't even have to have the kill spike macro right here but I think it might only affect this macro here. So the kill spike here might only affect the settings that you get through Fluvial, whereas this kill spike might affect the entire terrain. So we'll find out. Let's go ahead and build what we have now. And again, you can see even with the really harsh settings we had with Fluvial, it's still built really quickly. All right, so yeah, you can see right here is really hard to see, but here you can really see. These are some really intense Fluvial lines so much going on right here so that might be too much so I'll lower the depth and uh, let's go ahead and uh, lower the flow and the kill spike we'll see what we do if we lower this quite a bit maybe down to four so let's go ahead and do that and see what we get okay so that's not as harsh it's still really harsh not much um, you can see some flow lines going right here and starting small getting larger. Uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot of deposit going on, so maybe not a, too much uh, deposit maps being uh, created here. Uh, but it looks like you might be able to combine, combine this with NeoFlow. So let's try that. Let's go ahead and add this and let's throw in a combiner. Oops, combiner. And let's just combine these two and see what we get. Uh, before we do that, let's save. Oh my goodness, I don't want anything to happen 
while I'm halfway through a video and something goes wrong. I hate that. And I'll average it out and uh, this time let's make it more because in the last video I made it more towards the actual uh, sandstone node. Let's make it more NeoFlow. So <clears throat> we get the fluvial line still but they're being affected by the NeoFlow node more so. So let's build that and see what kind of changes just the basic default settings give us on NeoFlow. And it looks like it took about maybe eight seconds, nine seconds to build NeoFlow. Not too bad. All right, now you can really see the differences here. Still have some fluvial lines, but not too many. You can see them right here, right there, down here. But it, it looks like it's being overtaken almost by NeoFlow. So you can really see the flow lines right here as well. Uh, but it's being affected too much. So let's go to the combiner and let's raise this up to be about half. And let's... Let's try that. Okay, there we go. Now we see more flow lines from the fluvial node. Maybe uh, still a little bit more, but now you can really see what NeoFlow does, uh, especially to those uh, uniform flow lines that you get from the normal built-in erosion node. Really adds a little bit of depth of realism to it. So let's add a little bit more fluvial. And all right cool so that's that's interesting so I'll keep this a little bit lower I don't want those flow lines to be too prominent but I want them to be there so that's this seems like a really good balance and uh, that's that's awesome uh, we don't have those really ugly flow lines anymore so with NeoFlow you get all of these maps and they're just like maps that you would use in any other um, erosion node that you would put in here. Uh, same thing with here, you have the fluvial data for the fluvial macro here and uh, then you're combining them here. So if we wanted to colorize this based off of any of these maps we would have to combine the two and that can cause problems um, mainly because you're not gonna get all the detail that you may want but we'll go, we'll go ahead and try it. So let's combine just the erosion and then just the fluvial data. Actually, you know what? Let's take the deposit map here instead because it looks like we don't get a lot of deposit here in the fluvial, but we do here with NeoFlow. And then this is the com combination we get. And let's go ahead and get another um, output here, overlay view, and let's connect that. And let's throw in a converter colorizer and we'll just connect that and that. So now hopefully we have a 3D map here with some color but we need to go into the colorizer and change this. I'm just gonna choose drainage or something. You know let's not. Let's go with sedimentary. Okay I really like the way that looks. And uh, let's look at this. Okay so yeah it does work. Some 3D and we're getting some coloring going from our combiner. So the combiner I didn't change anything. It's still stuck at average 0.5. So let's look at what this looks like. Okay, so not too bad. You can see the deposits right here, as well as the flow from the fluvial. So it looks like that worked out relatively decent. Uh, let's go ahead and change. So let's lock the preview on this. And let's go ahead and change this to be additive. And let's add all of it, because we want to add the full data here and the full data there. Let's build that, and now let's look at that. Okay. So, it looks like the map actually turned out relatively fine using this method. Um, not so much right here. This doesn't look right. Uh, this is a deposit, and these are the flows. And it looks like it's depositing on top instead of at the bottom. So, there is an issue right here, and here, and here. So maybe not so much perfect, but it looks fine. Let's do a full. Okay. Yeah. Not perfect, but fine. Uh, for testing purposes, it might work. So <clears throat> we'll use a different method. Instead of using a combiner for flow maps, uh, we'll use a really cool option that comes in GeoGlyph, and that is the reflow. So that is right here. And what Reflow does is it takes data from your landscape and in a smart manner adds 
uh, an erosion uh, or flow data to that landscape and actually creates your maps for you without any kind of map data like flow map data and so that is really cool let's go ahead and throw in another colorizer and we'll just connect it to um, this and connect it to that and I think that will work uh, no this is gonna be really sharp and I'll show you you don't want to do this you'll get an error uh, world machines freaking out right here so you can't do an input to a colorizer that's a bad idea I should have known that so I'll just do it to um, a natural flow and connect okay give me just a second sometimes it's really funky <clears throat> So, let me pop. there we go. Sorry, that, that took me just a minute. So, I had to connect this. You have to do it to your primary input. I, you know, and with how much experience I have in World Machine, I should have known that. But you want to take the primary input, put it on the combiner, take the output, the flow height field here. You can use any of these. I decided to use flow. Connect that to the colorizer and then connect that to the overlay view. And now we're done. So, I'm going to go ahead and save. And I'll do it. And reflow doesn't take very long at all it's a really fast macro and now going off of here it should have in a very intelligent manner created flow maps for our entire landscape everything so uh, here you might want to change it a little bit so um, it'll, it's only affecting certain parts of the the terrain but you can see it's creating uh, flow maps in areas where there's actually terrain flow data so even down here even up here um, but what you can do is I didn't go in here and change any settings these are all the basic default settings uh, so I can change the regeneration here and you can see how that's really affecting the train so I'll go ahead and put this you know a little bit above you know halfway and then the intensity you can really see how that changes Wow okay so this is gonna be like interesting um, and then there's Soil quality, which here just tells you is it the soil hard, so maybe more rocky, down to extremely soft, like fine sand. So I'll just put soft and let's go ahead and build that. And obviously, like any other node, the more intense the settings, the longer it's going to take to build. But again, it builds relatively quickly. And uh, I'm going to save one more time. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at it. Oh man, so that really changes it quite a bit. Still realistic, looks really nice. You can see the flow map right here leads right down to where there's flow data. Uh, and so yeah, this is really accurate. It's really nice. Um, so this is really good if you have like a, D, a DEM file um, or maybe a height field that you forgot to um, export flow map data for. Uh, this can be an alternative for you. Uh, it might not be 100% perfect, but it's really close uh, and it will most likely work for most things so I would say this is a win this is a really good step forward in uh, the 3d scene uh, especially when you make a mistake and you forget to export data that you need uh, this lets you go back and fix that mistake and makes you look not like a moron so that's good I like that so right now we have <clears throat> um, alien it's not looking so alien now uh, but then we have ghost which kind of warped our terrain kill spike which destroyed those little spike areas that we got from the alien uh, generator connected that to fluvial erosion uh, which gave us those fluvial lines that we wanted the neo flow to kind of break up the uniformality if that's even a word of the fluvial macro combined it together at an average about you know a little bit more than halfway uh, connected that to reflow so we can get our flow data colorized it so we can see what it looks like in color and in 3d with the overlay view uh, you can even export these maps if you wanted to so you can set up a uh, output and you can come connect those you know to all of these if you wanted um, you're not limited to that it's just like any other erosion node uh, same thing with reflow you have these uh, flow map here and you know the wear data deposit and natural flow which let's go ahead and look at that real quick and then let's uh, build that so natural flow might be different than just the regular flow and uh, oh yeah definitely is a little bit different matter of fact this natural one 
looks like it might be even a little bit more accurate uh, than the other one. Again, it just comes down to experimentation, and that's exactly what I'm doing is experimenting. And uh, this looks really good as well. I would probably use this uh, more than the other one. It really depends on the terrain, I, I bet. Uh, but yeah, this I would use this. Looks good. And you can export that right here, just using these. So that's a lot of macros that we used. And we revisited two of them, but I've inter introduced one, two, three, four different ones. So <clears throat> uh, th I think this is a good place to cut off the video. So I don't want it to go on too long. So um, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know. Uh, rate, share, comment, subscribe. Please subscribe. Any of these, any time that you guys show that you're appreciative of this, it makes me want to do more for you guys. Um, also, visit my website, pwndesign.com. Uh, there will be a lot of resources regarding uh, uh, World Machine, Vue, uh, any other 3D application available there soon. Working on that, uh, but there will be some. So thank you for viewing, and have a nice day.